Welcome back to Spartan Up Podcast. This next one is incredible for two reasons, two amazing people. First of all, Amelia Boone. Most people who know anything about Spartan know Amelia, one of the greatest Spartan racers ever, just an incredible person, big time lawyer, great human being all around. She actually was the guest interviewer and interviewed Kristen Ulmer. Kristen Ulmer is the world's greatest female uh, big. big mountain skier, you know, big yeah, like, risks, like big rewards. Big surfing, like like Laird Hamilton doing his, yeah. his big wave surfing. This like, is like, like she, she she's doing the massive drops into huge shoots and like but, big but avalanche. We've all seen her on film and some you know somewhere when you see those films, that's her. And so she has a book called Fear. I believe the book is just called Fear, and she talked about fear. And this is I'm not going to tell you exactly what happened. But I'm going to tell you the biggest moment for me. Amelia interviewing her, and I've seen Amelia race, and I know Amelia pushes through fear like almost no one else and accomplishes big things. But the lights just went boom for Amelia in the middle of this interview. Something Kristen said about fear, and somebody who's dealt with fear her entire life in a fear-filled industry, speaking to one of the greatest racers of all time, but on the cover of Runner's Magazine, and just watching the lights go off. Lights go on. (laughs) Watching lights go on for Amelia. And it was such a wow, aha moment. And I think it will be for anyone who does big things and has to face fear. So I just want to leave it at that and have people come watch it. As always, we have uh, Dr. Johnny Waite, Joe DeSena, Marion behind the camera, and Suffer myself. Colonel Nye is out on an expedition currently. And uh, we will talk about this more when we come back. Hi, everyone. I'm Amelia Boone. I'm here hosting Spartan Up Podcast, and we are here at North Lake Tahoe for the Spartan Race World Championships. And I'm super excited today because we are joined by Kristen Ulmer, who is a former professional big mountain extreme skier and Everything about that is right up our alley here on Spartan Up. And she starred in over, what, 20 movies on extreme skiing, voted um, the most extreme female athlete, um, and really just has so much to teach us about fear and about everything that we here at Spartan kind of embrace as a culture. So let's kind of go back to the beginning for me is that I want to tell us a little bit about your experience like in athletics and your world and how did you get into it? Like, was it something that you always want to get into? Did it, was it, did it happen by chance? I have a very unusual background in that I didn't go to ski academies when I was a kid. I didn't have trainers. You know, I took a couple ski lessons in second grade and that was it. And I'm entirely self-taught. And I skied in jeans actually until I was 20 years old, which was saying I wasn't very committed to the sport. And certainly my parents weren't behind me on any of this. Is that a little bit cold? A little bit awkward? Well, yeah, I didn't know any better though. Right. And uh, then three years later, after I bought my first pair of ski pants, all of a sudden I'm on the U.S. ski team for moguls and I'm considered the best woman big mountain an extreme skier in the world and it was a title I kept for 12 years like it was overnight and I I'm like the poster child for it's all mental yeah because I never had any technical training and I was competing against people who had the best trainers in the world it was a really wild experience for me now did you always know that you were kind of different because it's such a it's such a different world and it's such something that where you really, I mean, there is danger out there and things like that. Did you, do you approach fear differently? Has it always been that way? Do you think it was something innate? Being a fear specialist now, it's taken me 30 years of experience to land on the answer to this question, (laughs) which is that um, I did the same thing that everybody does around fear. You know the words, conquer it, overcome it, put it out of your mind, rationalize it away. I was just really, really good at it. Mm -hmm. And I was probably as good at that as the skiing itself. And And how did you do that? I mean, do you have certain things that you did in that, in the course of your skiing to like put it out of your mind or compartmentalize it. Yeah. And let me just preface my answer by saying it's not the right thing to do by right. fear, right? <laughs> so uh, what, how I did it back then is I just became very stoic and okay. um, kind of stiff and rigid. And I also became very masculine. Like I didn't mm-hmm. see myself as a woman. I saw myself as a man. It was... It was an interesting time for me. And um, it's just, it's a bad thing to do. You, you, it works, you know? Yeah. Like, I was able to ski at a very high level and uh, be very stoic in the face of tremendous amount of fear. Um, but 
you can get away with it for about 10 years and then things start to go south and your life just kind of implodes or explodes and that's what happened to me and and uh that's why i ultimately you know in, in trying to heal some problems that i was facing became a fear specialist just to help my life that was limping you know kind of heal and do you think i mean because i've I experienced this in my day-to-day life, too, is that you can kind of compartmentalize and hold it together for so long before the wheels start to fall yes. off. And so how did that manifest for you? Or, I mean, like, what? Did, how did you start to notice it? And how did you come to this idea of that fear is something that we embrace and that fear is something that we don't run from, that we don't hide, that we need to come into and run into it? What happened for me personally is after about... 10 years of repressing fear, at a, uh, a lot of fear, I started having PTSD because I'd seen a lot of my friends die. I'd had dozens of near-death experiences. And I also started to burn out because if you're not dealing with fear in an honest way, you know, it takes a tremendous amount of energy to repress fear at that level. And it's just exhausting. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's a cause of burnout. I started to hate skiing. I didn't feel like I was an authentic person. I wasn't quite sure what I was faking, though. I had adrenal fatigue, like completely crashed adrenal system. And I had injuries that either weren't healing or I was starting to have more injuries. And it wasn't because I was getting older or in any less shape, uh, uh, less good a shape, but it was because... You know, I was very stiff and rigid in order to not deal with my fear. And what do we know about uh, rigid trees in a heavy wind? You know, they break. And so I was starting to break. Um, and those were my symptoms. But for other people who are repressing fear, then it may, you know, let's say you're not an athlete. It may show up as panic attacks, anxiety mm-hmm. disorders, depression, insomnia, like if you have a problem in your life, the avoidance or repression or controlling of fear, whatever you try to control winds up controlling you, has something or maybe even everything to do with it. Mm-hmm. And that's. And do you think that part of your, the reason that you were compartmentalizing, the reason that you know, being stoic was the way to be, you were one of the only females in a very male-dominated industry and did you notice a difference i mean were there any other women around you to to even play off of it or were since you were like the pioneer was it kind of like okay i have to adopt i have to be masculine i i have to conform to this there weren't that many other women in my sport and so when i say oh i was the best for 12 years i didn't really have that much competition every once in a while would a woman would show up and i'd be like oh geez you know <laughs> but then she'd get injured so quickly or something would happen and um what i i was competitive against the men yeah and every once in a while a woman comes along who's a rogue woman who ups the ante and i think that certainly in a dangerous sport that's very male dominated like skiing um, that's, those were the, I was competitive against the men. Like people would say, oh, you're the best woman skier I've ever seen. I'd be like, who cares, right? I just wanted to beat the men. Yeah. Like, I was looking oh, I at agree the best guy and I'm yeah. like, I'm coming after you. Like, oh yeah, <laughs> check this out. So, you know, that, that, and they were also repressing fear to skew the way they I'm wanted sure. to. I would actually say 99.99% of all athletes are repressing fear in order to perform they w- the way they want to, but we're just starting to see a new possibility, and that's yeah. kind of what I'm capturing in my work. Yeah. So you just so you, you the title is really fear specialist, and you wrote a book called The Art of Fear. Mm-hmm. And so, what are you finding now? That what is this approach? How do people people are okay? Like okay, I don't want to run away from fear. I want to kind of what should I do instead? Let me just preface it this way. And, you know, I'm talking to athletes. I'm talking to non-athletes, just people that maybe are doing big things with their lives, giving speeches, starting a company, like what have you. So this is, I see that there's kind of four levels of ways of dealing with fear. And the first level is what I've been outlining, where we, you know, the language, we try to overcome it, conquer it, rationalize it away, use our intellect to get rid of it. And that's the first level. And there are long-term consequences. You know, it works. Yeah. You know, you get temporary relief from fear. Like, you know, if you have a whining child and you ignore it, the child goes away, you think, well, that worked. But there are long-term consequences and for me, I outlined what my problems were, but for other people, it could be panic attacks, anxiety disorders, depression. Mm-hmm. So that's 
That's the first level. The second level, and I work with people sometimes who are like thinking about quitting their sport or quitting their business or kind of dumbing their life down just because they can't now deal with the consequences of level one, where they start to realize like, hey, fear is natural and normal. I am supposed to feel this way. Life is a scary experience, especially if I'm trying to start a business, right? Um, and then they also, there's, there's actually studies done um, by neuroscientists, all that, that determine that fear actually comes into, through, and out of our system in between 10 to 90 seconds. And so if I can just endure this 10 to 90 seconds, it'll be gone, and that'll be it. And so it's like, just sit with it? Yeah, just sit with it, right? Yeah. So that's, but that's only level two. But you can <laughs> see that's a huge step in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem with level two is that you're still in your head. You're yeah. still trying to rationalize, like, all right, I just got to be patient. You know, I am supposed to feel this. Like, so that's not the optimal performance level. Level three is where you start to feel your fear. Mm -hmm. Like, fear is a sensation of discomfort in our bodies. We think it's in our heads because we're thinking about it so much. But that's not where fear is. It's a, just a feeling in, our, in your body. And so we start to feel it. We allow ourselves to feel it instead of think about it. And that's huge. So that's level three. And what happens with level three is if you're willing to feel your fear, you quite organically um, become in your body. You, you, you start to perform from your body instead of your mind. And that's great, you know. So how does somebody feel their fear? Like, do you mean like just paying attention to bodily cues and things like that in, with regards to fear? Okay, we'll, we'll do that right now. Okay, and, let's right? do it. And, and keep in mind, we're still leaving level four out. And All right. We'll get to that, but... So I want you to close your eyes. Okay. And I want you to locate the sensation of discomfort in your body. And it may show up as anxiety, worry, stress, nerves. Those are just other names for fear. It's like we've gotten in the habit of not calling it fear, now we call it anxiety. Mm -hmm. Or anxiety specifically is undealt with fear. It also may show up as anger. Uh, because 95% actually of what we know as modern anger is undealt with fear. Mm -hmm. It may show up even as sadness because a lot of the emotions are blurred together. So tell me where you feel that sensation of discomfort in your body. I, I mean, it's really kind of gut, I think. Right. Yeah. So for me, I feel it in my chest right okay. now. And so that's the first step. Like, be curious. Where do I feel this yeah. sensation of discomfort. And notice we're kind of organically going into our body. And now be curious about your relationship with that emotion. Mm -hmm. Like, do you want to do a little exercise? Sure. Let's do it. All right. Let's, I like to personify fear. Okay. Let's say I'm your fear. I'm that sensation of discomfort in your body. And talk to me like you talk to it. And I want you to refer to me as you, like I'm a person instead of it. So just talk to me like you talk to that sensation that's in your belly. And it may <laughs> I know, I'm like, I have never, you. it's hard because I've, I've never considered this before. Because I'm probably, I'm one of those level one people that when I go out and I race, it's like you compartmentalize it, you put it aside. Right. And so, let me help you. Yeah. So then probably how you speak to me is, uh, you know, I don't like you. Yeah. I put you out of my mind. I'm not going to let you hold me back. You're not going to control me. Like, I'm, I'm better than this. Like, yeah, the, it's, it's definitely like go away. Like I've been here before. I don't need you. Right. And yeah. <laughs> so now look at me. Like this is how you talk to me. Yeah. How do you think I feel? You know, I as fear feel like, oh, you Jim, know, uh, like I, I care about you. I'm here to help you, you know, yeah. and I feel misunderstood. And, and um, however you treat fear, you actually treat yourself. And so if you're embarrassed by fear, you're embarrassed by yourself. If you ignore fear, you ignore kind of some things that are going on in your unconscious mind yeah. that maybe you shouldn't be ignoring. Um, I, that's why I like to personify fear, because fear now, of course, feels slighted. Like, let's say I'm a roommate or a child of yours. You know, that's called child abuse. Like, <laughs> we're now stuck living together. All of a sudden, we're at war. It's like, and I'm going to seek revenge. I'm going to start yelling louder. I'm going to try and do anything to get your attention. Because I just want to be seen and heard and recognized and considered. And, and you're just kind it of... It becomes this vicious cycle. Yeah. Because if I'm sitting here embarrassed to be fearful, yeah. and embarrassed to not embrace it, then right. I beat myself up 
and then it just it becomes this self-perpetuating, just like self-flagellation. Right. And we're going to be fighting with each other. You're going to be at war mm -hmm. with yourself at your core. Mm -hmm. And so I always say that your relationship with fear is the most important relationship of your life because it's the relationship that you have with yourself at your core. Mm -hmm. And if you have a combative relationship with it, you have a combative relationship with yourself. And so that's why I level one, and you know, you're not alone. Yeah. Like everybody does it. it. Not everybody. We're, like I said, just starting to see a new possibility. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and the thing is what you've done so far, there's a payoff. It works. It does, but yeah. only for so long. But only for so long. Because I've seen that. I mean, I've, I've been an athlete for a long time and well, I mean, not a long time, but fair amount of time. And I've faced injury. I faced burnout. I faced disillusionment with my sport. Mm -hmm. And so you start to wonder as things start to crop, fall apart, like maybe there's a different approach. Take burnout, for example. Yeah. Burnout is caused by one of two things, and it all has to do with fear. Either not enough fear in your life, like let's say you have a job and it's just not challenging. Right. You know, there's just not enough fear, right? You're, without fear, it's boring. You know, Without fear, skiing would be extremely boring. <laughs> like The whole reason why we go skiing is to feel fear. And the other reason why we become burnout is because we're just so exhausted from trying not to deal with our fear. Mm -hmm. And so you take out a sword and you try to fight me, I'm going to take out a bigger sword and I'm going to beat you every time because I'm fear and I will not be denied. Mm -hmm. You're like, you do not want to pick a war with me as your fear. Because <laughs> you can't beat it. Right. So back to your question, how do we feel fear? So all I want, I'm your fear, yeah. right? All I want and all anybody wants, you know, 7.5 billion people in the world, what do we want? We just want to be seen and heard and recognized and loved and considered. So that's all fear wants, too. Mm -hmm. So um, how you do that is you feel fear. You don't think about fear. Fear's in your body. It's not something to be thought about. It's something to be felt mm -hmm. and experienced. So go back to closing your eyes. All right. Find that sensation of discomfort. That's your fear. Notice your relationship with it. So first of all, next step is... Acknowledge that it's perfectly natural and normal to feel that discomfort. You know, you're trying to do amazing things with your life. Mm -hmm. you're, you're putting yourself out there. You, you host a podcast. You're doing these incredible races. Of course, you're going to feel fear. It's not a sign of personal weakness, not something to be embarrassed about. It just means that you're human. And so spend some time doing that. That can be life-changing for people. Yeah. You know, like, oh, my gosh, okay, I'm... This is not just me. Everybody feels this. It's okay to be vulnerable. Yeah, it's okay, it's okay. to be fearful. Yes. Absolutely. And then the third step is, because your question was, how do I feel it? So right now, I just want you to feel that sensation. And just give it your undivided attention. And you're not going to think about feeling it. You're not going to think about it. Because that just leads to kind of madness. You're not dealing with your emotion emotionally. You're dealing with it intellectually. It's very hard for a very logical yes. overthinker too. Yes. <laughs> and this would be really hard for people that are really smart. And they're mm -hmm. used to putting their intellect on the job to solve all problems. right? So we have to find the part of us that's more simple. Where you can just spend some time. It's like a meditation. Instead of observing your thoughts, you're just feeling your feelings. Mm -hmm. And this is a thought-free exercise. So just feel that feeling now. We'll do it for 15 seconds. And the key is you're doing this without trying to get rid of it. So what's going on for you? What is, what is this like? It's funny. It's kind of uncomfortable, but at the same time, it's almost reassuring because I'm sitting here being like, it's okay, Amelia. It's natural. Like, it's okay that you're fearful about these things, about life changes, about, about everyday happenings. And so I think, I don't know, it's, it's very kind of freeing in a way. And notice you immediately went back to your analytical mind. Yeah. And probably because we're doing this podcast, right? right. And this is the part of you that has to facilitate a podcast. Yeah. Um, but if somebody at home, let's say they have panic attacks or anxiety disorders or just a, a crippling amount of fear in their lives, if they just do this like one minute a day where they find the sensation, notice their relationship 
with that sensation, recognize it's normal and natural, and then just spend a minute just feeling it without trying to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. It absolutely can be life-changing because kind of like a whining child that finally gets undivided attention, you know, what do we know about whining children that gets love and consideration like that? They calm down. Yeah. And so fear will calm down. And and it'll be it'll it's a way for you to deal with your fear honestly, you know, every day like today, where's my discomfort? Okay, it's changed. Now it's in my my throat. And here's the thing too, if you have an injury even like an old broken leg or lower back pain, like there's the injury, but then also notice the emotional component, like the fear that you haven't been dealing with about what that injury implies. Like you can also do that with yeah. your injury and just spend some time just loving on that sensation. And it is counterintuitive because it's uncomfortable. But if you turn towards your discomfort instead of away from it, things change and they change really fast. That's incredible. I'm going to have a many more questions that I actually want to ask about that. But I think we're going to take a little break first right now. I hope you're not sitting still while you listen. If you are, you better get a burpee break in. We are back here with Kristen Ulmer, and we are going to dive some more into fear. So we have social conventions, social norms of how we deal with fear. What is so wrong about that? Like, what are people getting wrong? You know, our demons don't know why we don't love them. And what we tend to do, you know, there's two possible ways of living your life um, where you only try to align yourself with, like, joy, love, gratitude, forgiveness, um, beauty, wisdom. And then we have these unpleasant parts of life, fear, anger, sadness, stupidity, um, disappointment, frustration, right? And we tend to nurture these, and then we tend to shove these in the basement, lock the door, and throw away the key. Mm -hmm. And that's one way to live your life. I teach Zen. You know, it looks like that's Zen, like the image of the monk meditating on the cushion being all blissed out is hard to miss. Like, is that what he's doing? Right, right? yeah. And just like, let's put these out of our minds. But now imagine what's happening in the basement. You know, these children over here, or these roommates, these... They're getting rowdy right? down there, right? <laughs> They're burning the house down, and they will not be denied. And, you know, next thing you know, your life becomes all about just fighting those wars and, and pushing them down and not dealing with them. And it's, like I said, it's very exhausting. So the second way to live your life is to take these out of the basement and see the wisdom that they offer us. And it's a tremendous amount of wisdom. And... You know, like when we're in flow out there in our sport, in our lives, you know, that's the big buzzword. Yeah, what everyone's is, about flow states. Right, yeah. like what does that mean? Well, here's <laughs> no a idea. really, really simple definition. Yeah. You know, flow is not the absence of these negative of voices, I call them voices. Like, our frustration is a motivator. You know, our anger is here to right wrongs. Our sadness kind of breaks open our heart to come alive. Our fear takes us into higher states of awareness and, and focus and presence. And so we're leaving all these resources not only on the table, but we're also spending all our energy repressing them, and then whatever you repress becomes your repressor, or whatever you try to control winds up controlling you. Your life becomes all about not dealing with these things. It's just mm -hmm. such a bad idea. So here, you want to hear my definition of flow? Yes, please. So I love analogies. <laughs> okay. We think of flow, we think of water. So let's go with the analogy of me being a hose. Mm -hmm. Like... And drops of, droplets of water. In Zen, there's a uh, traditional number in Zen is 10,000. Like, there's 10,000 different voices or states of being. Here comes fear. Here comes a thought. You know, here comes a belief. Here comes frustration. Here comes anger. It's all flowing into, through, and out of my system 10 to 90 seconds, right? But if we see something that we wish weren't so, and we try to get rid of it or try to control it, the hose becomes kinked. We're no longer in flow with our lives. There's right. no longer just kind of our innate kind of changing nature running through, into, through, and out of our lives, you know, helping us become wise, become alive, motivated, all that. Instead, we're just fighting that war like I talked about. And so it's very important as an athlete that when we are frustrated, we just allow ourselves to be frustrated and find and the wisdom to sit in that. In that. And yeah. just sit and to experience that. Right. 
And then it because, but then what do you say to people? Because I've gotten in situations where the more attention that I pay to something, so if I start being like, I'm really anxious right now, I'm really anxious, and then I start spinning, and then I get in this, this loop where the more that I focus on it, the worse it becomes. So a part of me feels that I should just shut that out. But I feel like you're saying a bit of the opposite, is that like right. you need to love it and you need to nurture it. The problem in those moments is not the anxiety, it's the um, resistance to the anxiety. So I have a saying in my book, suffering equals discomfort times resistance. Like the discomfort is a problem, you know, it's anxiety, it feels unpleasant, and we humans have a long history of avoiding anything unpleasant. But in that moment, it's like, I wish it weren't so, I don't want this, I don't want this anxiety. The resistance is as big of a problem as the discomfort itself. Yeah. So breaking down the equation, let's say your discomfort, your anxiety is a level five, and your resistance to it is a level 10. What's five times 10? I don't do math. No, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, 50. Yeah. Right. So that's a lot of suffering. Yeah. Right? It, it's much easier to work with the resistance to the, to the discomfort than to try and lessen the discomfort. It takes so much energy to try and block something like that out, and we've talked about the long-term consequences. So let's say your anxiety is a level 5, but your resistance is a level 1. What's well, 5 times 1? Well, that's 5. It's a whole lot less suffering. Yeah. And then also we can tap into the wisdom of that anxiety, um, which brings us very neatly to level four. Right. We didn't get right. to level four. I right. was waiting for this. This right. is climax. <laughs> right. Like what if we could get the resistance down to zero? Yeah. So not only then is there no suffering, but then we also are able to tap into the energy resource that is that anxiety. Mm -hmm. So consider for a moment animals. Like, let's say Bambi's eating grass in a field, and all of a sudden, uh, there's, you know, fear in her system. Right. And, oh my gosh, her, she's perked up, her hearing is better, her eyesight's better, and there, it's a tiger. She starts running. And next thing you know, she's running faster than she ever has. She's totally present and focused and in the moment and in the zone athletically. Right. You know, because Bambi plus fear equals super Bambi. Like, we really don't get that fear is just such a huge, gorgeous energy resource. Emotions yeah. are energy in motion. Like, you know, how can we tap into this? Well, she doesn't have some sort of resistance like, oh, why me? You know, oh, do I really need to be afraid now? Like... We, we look to animals as a great, you know, example. Right. But, of course, us humans, you know, we're we a lot more it. complicated. But I'm sure, I mean, in, as an athlete, and especially doing what you did out there, like, fear is the main thing actually keeping you safe, probably. Absolutely. And I think that that's what people don't, I, you're coming full circle, is that people don't realize that. It's when you're bombing down a mountain, it's that fear that's keeping you focused and keeping you safe. Right. So you get that. Yeah. You know, but we forget about that. And so I think people like you, certainly people like me, we love feeling fear. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. It's yeah. The, it's a motivator. It's you get in the zone and right. you feel that. Right. Absolutely. I was motivated by fear of being invisible, mm -hmm. fear of not being loved. Like, it took me a while to realize that. I was a moron back in my 20s. Like, I didn't know that that was what was <laughs> we all We me, all live right? and learn, right? <laughs> right. And, uh, but if you look beneath your relative reality, you'll find that, like, fear of failure, you know, holds some people back, but it also makes other people thrive. Like, what's the difference? Yeah. Well, if you're embracing your fear of failure, you're motivated by it. But if you're avoiding it and pushing it down, you're crippled by it and you don't get off the couch. Right. And so fear is a great motivator. It keeps you safe. It takes you into the zone and little else does. Like, you get that. Yeah. And so you probably are like me is that you have a bit of a paradox going on. Mm -hmm. You love Absolutely. fear, and yet, what do you do with it? You hide it, you push it down, you try to right. address it, because a lot of people right. see it as a sign of weakness as right. well, to admit to it. Right. But it's something that I, you know, I fully believe needs to be embraced and talked about more, and people need to learn how to deal with that. And, and here, you know, you mentioned getting off the couch, and, and here at Spartan, we're all about getting people off the couch and getting out there, and, and really the, with these races, as it's going on outside our door right now, it's a lot of people confronting a lot of fears. But in these moments, when people are taking on a challenge, when they're out there, let's say 
they're in an athletic competition and there's that moment like what are your tips and tricks for people that they can take like little nuggets to help deal with that one of the best things you can do is change your language around fear. Mm -hmm. Like you just said, they're out there confronting fear. Like back to personifying right, back to, me. Yeah, like I'm confronting you. Like I'm facing you. And I mean, it just kind of reeks of Embracing like... Embracing fear. Fighting, yeah, right? yeah, change the language. Right. There we go. So <laughs> more learning. accurate is that there's people out there enjoying their fear. Oh, you I know? like that. Like if it weren't for fear, it wouldn't be all that interesting. That is very true. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for. You don't want to not be with fear out there. You know. So when I, when I was an athlete, I was called an adrenaline addict, right? Yeah. But beneath the adrenaline is fear. It's, it was uh, fear that I was addicted to. Mm -hmm. like, but it was almost pathological with me. Like It was like a heroin addict was drawn to heroin. So I really, I'm lucky <laughs> to be alive. Um, and I was repressing it to the extreme and all that. And so I wasn't dealing with fear in an honest way. And thus I didn't tap into my intuition and instinct. And so people out there changing your language around it, it's like, you know, your fear is also where your intuition and instinct comes from. Mm -hmm. Like you're afraid to do the race, but you're also afraid not to do the race. Like beneath every decision you make, you know, you're afraid to go for it, but you're more afraid not to go for it. So you go for it. Like it's there in every decision, yeah. in every moment practically that we make. And so level four, though, like if somebody can learn how to do this, mm -hmm. they'll be unstoppable. Okay. And, I, and I've interviewed. I need to know this. <laughs> yeah, you ready? Tell me how I am unstoppable. Yes, you ready? Yes. Okay. And I'll preface it by saying, you know, I've talked to a lot of professional athletes. Yeah. And like I said, 99.99% of all people repress fear in order to perform the way they want. And they don't really understand the motivating force behind it and that they're drawn to it. So that's a, a big, profound shift. But... I've interviewed the best and the best of the best in the world at their super dangerous sport, like big wave surfing, extreme snowboarding, kiteboarding, and the best of the best of the best, they all say it's the same word, and it's the same word I used in my book, and mm -hmm. we kind of all um, have landed on this word, but the best of the best are intimate with their fear. Okay. Intimate, like lovers. Yeah. You know? So the question is, how can, just ask yourself, like, how can I be intimate with this sensation of discomfort in my body? And that's level four, mm -hmm. where you're doing a dance with fear, either down the mountain or on the wave. Um, you know, extreme sports are notorious for taking people into the zone. It's because people become intimate with their fear, and then them plus fear equals superhuman, super right. athlete. And if they can learn how to tap into that and to embrace that, and to really just change the language around it. Mm -hmm. And I think that mind shift is so key and can be so helpful for so many people right. out there. And it's incredible that somebody is talking about this now. And I'm thrilled to be talking about it with you. And so, um, yeah, I mean, so the book is called Art of Fear, correct? Mm -hmm. And where else can people find you? If they want to if they want to learn more about this, if they want to learn more about fear, how to how to change the relationship with it. Like where can we find you? My website is kristenolmer.com, K R I S T E N U L M E R.com. My book's a great resource. I do uh, private coaching, I do live events, ski camps, online at-home courses, webinars. Um, I, it's I've been working with thousands of people over the years. I've worked with a lot of athletes, but I've also worked with a lot of people that are just struggling with real world problems like depression or panic attacks, these anxiety disorders. You know, I'm not just a mindset sports coach. Probably 95% of my clients aren't athletes, actually. Because yeah. um, that's the thing is like, it's fear is not just for, you know, big wave surfers or extreme skiers. It's anybody daily in their life. But I will say that when I work with athletes, I, I will only work with them for about three hours, and they usually come to me because they're underperforming. And w the reason why I became a fear specialist is actually I found that if I healed somebody's relationship with fear in just a very short period of time, it doesn't take that long. It's not yeah. therapy, right? I, it's a facilitation tool I use. Then their underperforming goes away very quickly. And I've seen somebody go from being a great skier to being like 40% better in one run and you know then they have to do the work they have to go home right. like if you show somebody their new golf swing is that their new <laughs> golf swing no but they have to then have a fear practice and I help them with that I mean it, it really is profound the difference in somebody's athleticism 
um, when, it, when you finally merge with your emotions and use them as a tool for creativity and aliveness instead of um, just fight a war with them. Yeah. This is so incredible. I am so excited to have this conversation. Thank you so much for being here. Again, we are here at Lake Tahoe at the Spartan Race World Championships. Kristen Ulmer, who has just blown my mind with everything about fear right now. So check her out. Thank you for being with us. That was absolutely awesome. Yeah. Great job, and Amelia. For me, I, um, I just face fear. I just go head first into it. But, but she took it to another academic level. Yeah. And uh, there were so many things I was being taught that... Um, were obvious, but somehow I missed them my whole life. What was the big thing that jumped out at you? Well, when, when she talked about exactly that, about, you know, like, just pushing your fear down, and that's what we're taught to do. We're taught to, like, you know, just do it anyway, push that fear down. And it's always about denying the fear. Like, you know, just what would you do if you weren't afraid, right? And she basically said, but you are afraid. And instead of making yourself wrong for that and trying to fight it and getting an ulcer, and as Amelia said, she said, you can only do it for so long until one day you break down, it bites you in the ass. And, um, and uh, she said, be with your fear. Understand that you have fear. Of course you have fear. You know, when you're going out and you're coming back from an injury like Amelia and you're going to go out and face all of your competitors who are gunning for you and you know you're not 100%, you're fearful. But instead of pushing the fear down, just say, yeah, I'm fearful. Okay, I'm yeah. fearful. And I'm going to go run with that fear. And she talked about in, in big mountain skiing that fear... And I love this analogy because it ties into other things, but it was very visceral with what she was talking about. Fear makes you tight, right? And when you push that fear down, you're tight. And you're even tighter because you're resisting. And then you go and try and do a 100-foot drop off a cliff. You can't be tight when you land. You're going to break. And she said, you just got to be okay. When you're okay, and you accept and embrace that fear and say, cool, that's what it is. And so really, it's mindfulness. It's the idea about instead of fighting, resisting, denying, just be with that's, that was it. How does that tie into, like, trees blowing in the wind? Oh, that's, oh yeah. that's exactly what she said. No, it's true. I mean, like, the rigid trees, especially in Icelandic wind, you know, like, they're the first ones to break. And it's like the bamboo, that's the analogy in Chinese culture of how you should be. It should be able to be strong because they build buildings with it, but fluid in, like, a hollow vessel. And that's what she says is the hose. You let fear just flow through you, and it's just... Um, there, there used to be that old company that had wherever the fear may be, look it in the eyes, no fear, you know? And I feel like so often in this culture, we try to pretend that fear is like this vulgar word that doesn't yeah. exist. But I love how she's saying, this is the most important relationship you have. You know, the way you treat fear is the way you treat yourself. And what you oppress becomes your oppressor. I thought those were such great points because it's saying this is a normal reaction. And as they said, this is a good reaction. This is a survival instinct yep. because that fear heightens your awareness. And that's what makes you, you know, have a little bit more judgment and keenness to what's going on. And so a, a similar way of saying whatever you oppress becomes your oppressor, yep. repress becomes your oppressor. It's the idea that what we resist is what persists. Sure. So, you know, if welcome some, it. Exactly. If you just keep telling somebody, stop that, stop that, stop right. that, stop that, they're going to keep doing it. And the idea is, the more you push that fear down, and, I, and I, I like the way she talked about it, it creates a whole other layer. Now you feel guilty about feeling fearful. So you have two things to feel bad about now. Sure. As opposed to, I'm just going to stop fighting this, and it's just going to be there. And, you know, I think she said, when you really feel fear, it can only last four to ten seconds. I can't remember the exact number. Ten but to ninety or something. Ten to, like 90, that, yeah, 10 10 to is, ninety seconds, yeah. And the yeah. idea of, but resisting it can last forever. Right. And um, I'm going to give you a, a neat um, analogy that my because um, it's with all emotions, right? These negative emotions are what we call negative. We try and push away. My uh, my uncle was dying. This is five six years ago, maybe seven years ago. Great great guy. And my cousin was devastated. It was her dad. She loved him to death. And she called me one day for some coaching, and she said, "I am sad 24 hours a day, and it's it's hurting my relationships, hurting my business, hurting my kids. I'm just sad 24 hours a day." And I said, "You're not sad 24 hours a day. You're spending 24 hours a day trying to not be sad." Because you can't be sad for 24 hours. Like, if you really sit with that sadness and let it flow through you, you'll come out the other end of it. And I said, but the biggest thing is your dad is alive right now. And you can't even face him because when you walk in, you burst in tears because he's going to be dead pretty soon. And instead, and she actually practiced this. She would go and make her sad time where she'd take two hours a night and lock herself in a room and actually just cry and cry and cry and then come out and be great with her kids and be great with her husband and be great with her dad. And so the idea about 
fighting that sadness, fighting that fear, fighting whatever that thing is, instead of just being with it, letting it flow through you, and then going on with your life. That's exactly like what uh, Shannon Lee, which was a past episode we had, who's Bruce Lee's daughter, said, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, her father passed, but his philosophy lives on, and he'll forever be with her. And she talks about that great analogy about water, right? Water, be when water. there's obstacles. Be like that, water. Be like water. Like, there's sadness, but flow around it, sit with it, you know, be with it and get beyond it. And it's like this fear again, it's all of those neural brain waves. And the more you fire it, the deeper that cavern gets that associates something like fear with sadness or suffering my mother, or embarrassment. My mother, my mother was pushing this like in the seventies, right? Yeah, and and by the way, this is all this knowledge is has well been known beyond forever, the 70s. You know? yeah. We've known this forever. Yeah. And and the idea was, Joe, no negative thoughts. Now as a young kid in the seventies, I'm like, Mom, you're a freak. Like how could a thought possibly have any impact one way or the other, but now we know. Well, and, and, but that's the interesting thing because, you know, you'd reference no fear. And so some people would say no negative thoughts means you can't have fear. No fear because fear is a negative thought. Say again? K and No fear, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, the idea is that as long as we make fear a negative thought, we can't have that, right? And so sure. you can't be afraid of things. I had an experience here. Uh, by the way, w- here, you'll notice we have a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of a different background. We are here in Iceland at the Spartan Ultra World Championships. And crushing part, it. We are crushing, crushing it in Iceland right and par- now. As part of that, as part of that, we have, an, we, ice, as part of that we have an agogi going on here, our 60-hour endurance event. And I had the good opportunity of being part of the, uh, the directors of that. He's and I just want to talk about fear because um, yesterday we had to go down underground under an active volcano field and crawl through a half mile long Stalag underground night, cavern tight. cave some of which was so narrow you didn't think you could slide through i'm tremendously claustrophobic and i knew for about an hour that we we're going to do it and as we're walking towards it i started thinking i'm, I'm terrified i'm terrified of doing this and i thought just push it away don't don't be afraid well, I am afraid. I, I, there's no way in which I'm not afraid to do this. And I had actually, in my head, formulated the thing to say, listen, we don't all need to go in there. Somebody's got to be waiting at the other end. I'll just go down and wait for you guys. <laughs> you, take, you, no you take the participants. They have to do it because they're racing, right? And all of a sudden I thought, and it's funny, I, I, I honestly had this thought, you're afraid. It doesn't mean you can't do it. Be afraid. And all of a sudden I thought, you're going to be down there, and you are going to be afraid. You may very well poop your pants. <laughs> But do it anyway. So, so it wasn't don't be afraid. Get it was feel, feel the fear and do it anyway, right? Yeah. Or get yeah. On, yeah. Start, so, to, start to figure out a way yeah. to enjoy that. Yeah. And, and, that, and that's, what, that's what infiltrates our, our brains here, right? Is like we realize that, that that's just being afraid is as much a part of a life as not being afraid. And you got to, it's like the yin and the yang of your soul. If you got to embrace both of it to be a balanced human. And talking about the negative thoughts, there was a Japanese scientist, I forget his name, who studied water. Did you guys ever see this study? Yes. And yes. it's like, our bodies are something like 70% water and so is the earth. So water is a huge part of our existence. Existence. And so when he thought negative thoughts towards the water, they were all like shattered and fractal and really like well, not. When, when, when they might put a microscope on it. Yeah. And, and, and it's it. funny. I, I know. We're in the land of ice. So, and, then, and, and, and I know him and it's funny. I, for one, whatever reason, it's one of the few things I'm really skeptical of. Like I don't buy it, but I know the philosophy and I, and, right. I, and I know that he's done all kinds of studies and he can back it up. I remember seeing that and thinking, hmm, I don't, I don't get it, but I, but I get the philosophy. But it's for sure. intention. Sure. But I, 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 I'm just not 100% sure that it's water is people, conscious of our intention. It, I'm not saying you're wrong because there are a lot it, more people think you're right. But water is considered the collective unconscious that throws through all mankind. It's like the zavuya because it goes to the water, goes through the hydrological cycle, and is created nor destroyed and always exists. With that, I just want to say there's one thing I'm really fearful of that I just can't get over. This podcast ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, so? you, you know, yeah. So, so we'll we'll we'll, we'll throw to the uh, the the uh, the hook. But I I I just want to say it's amazing we get to talk to all these people and um, who 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 do deal with life things and 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 fear and success and 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 struggle and, and it's amazing. We're very fortunate for that. And if you want to see. This podcast does have to end. So if you want to see more podcasts and more incredible people who are doing incredible things like Amelia, like Kristen, like these guys, goes on and on. Go to friend. YouTube, iTunes, subscribe, Spartan Up Podcast, and come see us every week. Toodles. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for watching another epic story of success. If you like our message, please share Spartan Up with your friends and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you catch our show, maybe in the woods. Spartan Up is brought to you by Spartan Race. To find a race near you, visit Spartan.com.